Good morning and welcome to December Grand Rounds. I wanted to start uh, with a land acknowledgement um, that Seattle Children's recognizes that we are on and using the traditional unceded lands of many indigenous communities and tribes and our facilities occupy tribal lands across Washington, Montana, Alaska, and Idaho. And we honor with deep gratitude the land itself, the people, the tribes past and present who have called this land home. This acknowledgement doesn't take the place of authentic relationships with indigenous communities, but is one way that we can honor this land. Today, we are excited to have uh, Dr. Carlson speaking to us. And I want to introduce Dr. McClellan, who is a, an esteemed professor in our own department and a longtime colleague of Dr. Carlson to introduce her. So, thank you, Carol. Uh, yeah, no, we're very fortunate today. Uh, Gay is one of the most preeminent child psychiatrists in the world. But more important to me, she's a dear friend. We've known each other forever. I can track my entire career around meetings and committees I've had cocktails with Gay at. Uh, she maintains she's a lightweight, but she can hold her own pretty well. Um, last night, we had a lovely dinner with several of us and Gay, and we're talking about sort of relationships and who's influences in our career. And I really think, honestly, to me, that's what defines your career that leadership, mentorship, teaching, the legacy that you're leaving behind and the number of lives that you've touched is just enormous. Um, I was gonna read your CV, but it's 75 pages and it's really small print. So, <laughs> so there's just a few things I'm gonna highlight and then I'm gonna hand it over to you. Uh, Gay and her husband, uh, Harold, uh, made this incredible endowment to the Academy, to the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. Uh, for a psycho psychopharmacology research award that will be funding future current and future young folks in doing research in psychopharm. As it turns out, we need a lot better treatments than we currently have. And so I think it's, again, it's just very fitting. Your legacy is not only the work that you've done, but the people that will come after you and the work that you've sponsored. Uh, Gay was the president of the Academy, <coughs> excuse me, from 2019 to 2020. Folks may have forgotten that was a pretty interesting time in our country and our world. Uh, and so believing you're going to be the president and have all these meetings and plan on a bunch of stuff and all of a sudden COVID shuts the world down uh, was a pretty incredible time. And we were lucky to have our leadership. Not all presidents actually did well during that time. And so, but you were marvelous. <laughs> Uh, and is every president of the academy has their own initiative. And Gaze was the uh, motion dysregulation of children and adolescents uh, coming together to treat the sickest kids. She's going to be talking about some of the work that emanated from that. Uh, she created this task force with a lot of incredibly smart and talented people. And then one slacker, I happen to be on it. It was very uh, fortunate that she asked me. And uh, we're going to hear what she did. So thank you, Gay. Love to have you here. Thanks, Jack. Um, and thanks for mentioning two things. First of all, the initiative, which Jack was one of my stalwart co-initiative people, um, and we do go back a long time. Um, he, he's an incredibly bright and fun person, and you're really lucky to have him. Um, and the other thing is, I do appreciate your mentioning the Psychopharm Initiative, because it is my hope that maybe somebody will be able to go out and find something that helps these kids, because I think we all know that they are one of the most challenging bunch of kids that we've got to contend with. So anyway, we're going to talk about that this morning. Um, thank you for coming. Um, it, one of the fun things about virtual meetings is that I, as I was worrying about the weather and whether the fog was going to keep me from coming, I said, well, at least I could do it virtually, even if it doesn't work out that I can come in person. But in person is a lot more fun. So anyway, these are my disclosures. I'm going to start off with a kid because I think that's what centers me and it centers a lot of us. This was Zeke. This was one of our one of the kids that I consulted on. He'd been <clears throat> suspended from school for threatening to kill his teacher because she didn't help him fast enough with a math problem. Um, however, he'd had a history of frequent outbursts with minimum provocation since first grade. He'd been diagnosed with ADHD. Uh, he was given five milligrams of methylphenidate, switched to Oros methylphenidate, 18 milligrams, um, and he had taken that through the sixth grade. <clears throat> his parents, when he 
um, was in first grade, was, were going through a contentious divorce, that was felt to be the cause of his problems and he was put into therapy. In second grade, they recognized that uh, his ADHD was problematic. He was given uh, an IEP for other health impairment. However, his only intervention was resource room and resource room for ADHD is like being able to have oxygen, you know, once an hour if you've got severe pulmonary problems. Um, after this threat that he made uh, to kill the teacher, um, and by the way, he was actually caught online looking for ways of killing teachers. So this wasn't just a, oh, I'm gonna kill you kind of a threat. Um, the uh, the um, practitioner diagnosed uh, DMDD, dis uh, disruptive mood dysregulation disorder. She added guanfacine one milligram, and then she added five milligrams of um, aripiprazole and uh, his outburst continued. He was actually a cute kid, nice kid. He was remorseful about his impulsive statements. I didn't mean it. I, I just have this terrible habit of shooting off my mouth. There was no history of violence. He, he talked a good game, but he did not have a history of, of violence. But the staff was terrified that he would carry out his threats. Hence, they called our school consultation team. So the learning objectives today is to understand the history of how we got interested in irritability, to describe the phenomenology of outbursts, review differential diagnosis, outcome and treatment. And we'll talk about my definitions. Um, irritability is proneness to anger. It's kind of like almost sneezing. It's a feeling, it's a characterization. And you can be irritable for a lot of perfectly normal reasons. You're uncomfortable, it's hot, the plane is late, your shoes are too tight. It, you know, it puts you in a bad mood. Um, it becomes pathological when the feeling is sustained and the manifestations are destructive and impairing. And in terms of the outbursts, they are developmentally inappropriate displays of anger and distress manifested verbally, like with Zeke, or verbal rages, uncontrolled crying, or behaviorally with physical aggression towards people, yourself, or property. They're grossly out of proportion in terms of frequency, intensity, and duration to the situation of provocation, and they lead to functional impairment. Now, not all irritability ends in outbursts. Not all outbursts are due to irritability. We're going to be talking about where they're lined up today. <clears throat> this is a simplified chart uh, from uh, two people who wrote the seminal paper in 2017 on the overlap of irritability, anger, and aggression. And we hear the word transdiagnostic. What it means is irritability crops up in a lot of different things. And so you can see with my purple highlights, those are conditions in which irritability or irritable mood shows up as a symptom. The yellow is for outbursts. There are some overlap with post-traumatic stress disorder and disruptive mood dysregulation disorder, but some things have irritable mood without outbursts. A bunch of things have aggression. The real thing to look at though, are the bottom three conditions, autism, ADHD, and Tourette's disorder, which are probably the conditions that have the most outbursts and you don't see any of the irritability or outbursts there in the symptoms. So where did DMDD come from? Well, not a coincidence. Back in the days of when this was called the hyperkinetic child or the formulations that we had of this condition prior to 1980 said that this condition was characterized by hyperactivity, impulsivity, distractibility, but there was also an emotion regulation piece of it. Fits and anger easily provoked reactions of volcanic intensity. This was, comes out of the Laufer and Denhoff, Denhoff 1957 paper. Reactions of volcanic intensity. Isn't that a wonderful definition of outbursts, right? And variability, kids sometimes good and sometimes bad. Well, those two things got not included in the, <clears throat> in the DSM-3 formulation of ADHD or ADD as it was called then. And an old friend of Mark Stein's and mine, Denny Cantwell, who was on the DSM committee, I asked him, Denny, why, didn't, why wasn't this included? And he said two reasons. First of all, it wasn't uh, um, only a feature of ADHD. And second of all, we didn't think we could get much reliability on the symptom. So it isn't that we don't think it's important. We put it in the text. 
Well, A, the brain doesn't really care about what you put in the text and what you put in the criteria. And B, there is one condition in which you can have hyperactivity and impulsivity and distractibility and irritable mood and outbursts and episodes, and that's mania. So what we ended up with was we didn't ask about the emotion regulation symptoms when we were getting information on ADHD, not asked in research interviews if it's tucked away in the text. It resurfaced as juvenile mania, the defining characteristics of which were chronic severe outbursts and not episodes, plus overlap of ADHD type symptoms. Um, in DSM-5, they shored up the mania criteria to be clearer about episodes. The way they had been reading was you had an onset at least a week's worth of but you could have at least a week's worth of and, and have it start from the age of two and continue to the age of 12, and it never has an, has an offset, so it's not an episode. So anyway, they did a better job with the offset bit, and then they created a new disorder to keep kids from being diagnosed falsely with bipolar disorder and given atypical antipsychotics. You probably know all of that. The first diagnosis was severe mood dysregulation, was developed by Ellen Liebenloff, uh, who did not have any designs at all on remaking the DSM-5 when she started this line of research. She just wanted to distinguish chronic irritability and outbursts from episodic irritability from outbursts. However, this ended up getting hijacked by the DSM-5 committee, recognizing the fact it was not ready for prime time, but saying we really want to do this because the, the um, inappropriate use of bipolar disorders or diagnosis for many of these kids has just got to stop. Well, so no big surprise, given the fact that this sort of came from not acknowledging uh, the emotion regulation problems in ADHD, what you find in dysregulated, in disruptive mood dysregulation disorder is an awful lot of ADHD and its close brother oppositional defiant disorder. So about 80% of clinical samples of DMDD have these two conditions. What this is important about is not for, you know, you old timers out there who were around for this transition, but for you new guys and, and new women who are in the business, DMDD is not a bunch of people that just dropped in out of the sky or flew in from Mars. They're, they're, not, they're not a new bunch of problems. This is old wine and new bottles. And so the, the old wine is a lot of ADHD and oppositional defiant disorder, along with internalizing disorders. Okay, so a lot of comorbid anxiety disorders, somewhat less uh, major depressive disorders. The um, if, if you look at the ADHD and, and dysregulation business, and, and don't worry about the fine print, the, the, the slides there to, to remind me what to say. Basically, what you say, see is in the general population, in a group of kids who've got ADHD, a high proportion of those people have a high level of irritability. Or if you look at a specific sample of kids, well-defined kids with ADHD, 75% of them will have hot temper, low frustration tolerance, unpredictable shifts in anger and dysphoria. Um, and 25% of those will be severe. And this is not something that goes away. I mean, it's a core symptom really should be sustained. And, and it may be developmental in that it gets somewhat better, but it's always developmentally inappropriate. And so if you follow up Russ Barkley's clinical Milwaukee sample, you see that two thirds of his ADHD people grow up, continue to have overreactive, emotionally quick to anger and easily frustrated compared to less than 10% in the general po uh, in his control population. So what do we know about DMDD? Well, I need acronyms to remember anything these days. My acronym for ADHD is HIDE because that's what you want to do when you have these kids, a hyperactivity, impulsivity, distractibility, and emotion, emotional ability. So my criteria for DMDD is OIVE. The O is for outbursts, frequent impairing in more than one place. So it isn't just a conflict with your you know, mother or the teacher. I, I is for irritable mood, we're not having outbursts. V is very chronic, it has to have lasted at least a year. E is if it's explained by another better understood condition like mania or major depression or PTSD or anxiety or autism, uh, it's not DMDD. 
and you can't diagnose opposition to defiant disorder either. The point is that out, uh, outbursts occur in many conditions that really need to be ruled out first, and in my opinion, because we know something about how you treat those things, whereas this thing we just haven't developed good treatments for. And the why is young, it starts in childhood. You don't diagnose it till after age six, uh, and you're not supposed, to, it, shouldn't, it shouldn't be starting de novo after age 10. So understand, of course, there's a difference between symptoms and disorder. The symptoms, outbursts rather than grumpy mood is the common reason for help seeking. There, um, there, there's many more outbursts than there is DMDD. So in preschool kids, you have about 18% of preschoolers, 10% to six to 12 year olds, 5% of teens can have some degree of, of outburst, temper tantrums or whatever. The diagnosis of DMDD is really less than, you know, like 3%, 1%, 0.5% in adolescence. <clears throat> it's highly comorbid, as I've already said. The diagnosis may come and go, but the symptoms are stable. So if you look at a population of kids who've got DMDD at time one, time two, or two years later, or four years later, about half of them no longer meet DMDD criteria. Well, they have not necessarily gotten that much better. They still have the emotion dysregulation, but now they're missing a criterion. Maybe they don't do it in three places. Maybe they don't do it, you know, three times a week anymore. But the fact is they still continue to have the symptoms and it's an important distinction to make. Grown up, community studies of ADHD with DMDD retrofitted into childhood data Reveal, <clears throat> reveal that there are, you know, that what, what this becomes or, or what seems to develop is dysthymia, depression, and anxiety. What doesn't happen is bipolar disorder. So this DMDD thing or SMD thing, at least if you looked at the retrofitted data, does not, you know, the, the zebra doesn't change its stripes and become bipolar disorder, which is the main reason I think that this you know, thing was invented. But here's the problem. If you take the top two to 5% of the irritable kids, which is the ones that we see clinically, they continue to have problems with aggression. They may or may not develop antisocial behavior and anxiety and depression are not the main problems. And that's important because if you really look at irritability and DMDD, you really have those two components that I showed you in the, in the very beginning. You've got the internalizing part, the mood part, easily annoyed, easily angered, gets angry often. You can measure it with the, the thing like the affect reactivity index, which I'll show you in a minute. The follow-up of that piece is internalizing disorders. That's the anxiety and depression. If you look at the externalizing part, the phasic, quote unquote, phasic part, the outbursts, the yelling, screaming, tantrums, et cetera, et cetera. If you follow that component up, it predicts ADHD, ODD, and outbursts. The symptoms, the behaviors may have attenuated, but they are still worse than the control sample, the community sample with which they will be compared. So what's the differential diagnosis of the explosive outbursts? And the reason that we ended up with outbursts, as Jack will tell you for my initiative, is, is that's the problem. I don't, you know, I'm, I'm fairly old now. I've been in this business for 40 some years. I have never seen anybody rush their child to the emergency room because he was in a bad mood, okay? They rush them to the emergency room because of the outburst. They call the police because of the outburst, not because the kid is in a pissy mood, okay? So it's the outburst that really need to have our focus. If they're rare, then we don't have DMDD in the differential. We don't have bipolar in the di differential. Intermittent explosive disorder, you're not going to hear me say much about it. That was one of those things that got pulled out of whole cloth in DSM-5. <clears throat> Emil Kakaro, who invented an intermittent explosive disorder, says, my, my IED kids we're not your DMDD kids. This is not the same thing. Okay. So you're not going to hear much from me about intermittent explosive disorder. But anyway, if the outbursts are frequent, which is when we really worry about them, 
then the first cut is, is this a change in behavior from the person's usual self? If it's a child, you worry about a stressor. You worry about trauma. You worry about the kids in school. He's got learning problems. He's being bullied. He's having trouble with his peers. He's at home. There's family problems there. He's being abused. Um, somebody discontinued his ADHD medications. He has an anxiety disorder. And I'm using he because I have a hard time saying they, but this is any gender you want. Um, so that's a child. If it's an adolescent and we're talking about a change in behavior, now you're talking about a high likelihood of a mood disorder, depression, mania, anxiety disorder, drugs, substance abuse, psychosis. That's if it's frequent and a change in behavior. If it's been chronic, then you want to know is the kid irritable between outbursts, in which case now we're talking about a DMDD thing. If you're talking about the kid is just fine, thank you very much, until he's frustrated, then you're talking about, or if he's got a temporal loss and he's defiant, then you're talking about ADHD and oppositional defiant disorder, and you can have any of those kinds of things with autism. So this friend of mine, Jack McClellan, has a nice way of, of conceptualizing irritability. He talks about what the child brings to the table, which is temperament, sensory sensitivity, cognitive and developmental lags, uh, or the disorders that I was talking about. He looks at the environment. Is there a family conflict, parental psychopathology, uh, the domestic violence, poverty, and racism? And the outbursts have um, reasons for them. They, they are not you know, happening out of the blue. They, they happen because the kid is attention-seeking. He's blowing off steam. He wants emotional relief. There's avoidance for, for an anxiety disorder, uh, getting control over the environments that some of the kids on our inpatient unit were the pot stirrers is, is what we used to call them. And, and they were the ones that really were stirring things up to get some control over the environment. And what I don't think people truly understand about outbursts is they are a double-edged sword for the kid. It's scary to think that he renders the adults around him or her helpless it's also exhilarating. And so if you don't get these things early on before they've been reinforced, I'm afraid they grow and they get worse. One of the things that I had been trying to do, and it was one of the arguments that I lost with the late David Schaffer, was I wanted there to be modifiers to the diagnoses we have to recognize the fact that you can have outbursts with everything. And what I wanted to do is what we do in, um, in, in mood disorders, where we have um, mania with, you know, with psychosis or depression with psychosis. I wanted to have ADHD with explosive outbursts or, or major depressive disorder with explosive outbursts. But it turns out legitimately that's hard to sort of build into the criteria. But it turns out that there are these things called R codes that I never knew anything about, tucked away in the back of the ICD, which are basically for signs and symptoms of, of things that are the reasons for seeking help. And it came up for me personally, I had a cough and I was really bad and I went to see the pulmonary doctor about it. And, you know, I looked up in my patient portal afterwards what he thought, and he had down R code, cough. He didn't worry that I had pneumonia, tuberculosis, cancer. He didn't have any of that stuff in there. He got away with R code, cough, okay? It turns out that you can do that with signs and symptoms of behavior problems in people. You can have an R45.4 for irritability and anger. We have hostility, violent behavior, et cetera, et cetera. We have everything but tantrums or outbursts. We tried valiantly in my um, initiative to get this coded. The DSM people said, oh, we'll buy that. That's really good. It, it, was, it was positively received by the community. The ICD people said, nope, we're not going to do that right now. So what we've got is we can use R codes like the irritability and anger, and we can use the R code NOS for outbursts. And maybe somebody younger than I am who becomes president of ACAP can try to get this passed for the ICD folks. 
But this way, what you can do is you can put down major depressive disorder with irritability and anger or with violent behavior or whatever it is, so that you can specify that this is really what's bringing the child to the emergency room or your outpatient or your inpatient unit. So what can we do about it? Well, think about a bomb. What does lights the fuse is the trigger. The length of the fuse is the uh, emotional reactivity or tonic irritability, a term I hate, by the way. The size of the explosion or the phasic irritability or, or what gets called efficient self-regulation. So the size of the explosion makes a difference and how long it lasts. So if I go, God, blast it, and then that's it, you know, no big deal. If I, you know, throw this at somebody that, you know, that that's, you've got high severity, even if it's low frequency, but you, you've got a number of different dimensions here that are going on that you would need to take into account here. So you're going to hear about measures for the next couple of minutes. I'm a firm believer in the use of global measures because what you want to be able to do is you want to be able to look at the child, not only the particular symptoms you're interested in, but globally, how does this kid fit within the realm of severity? So, and I don't get any money from, uh, from Tom Achenbach. I don't care about whether you use his things or the Basque or the um, Connors or whatever, but something that gives me a way of knowing how severe this kid is. The CBCL is good because it's got these three items that people have used to study irritability. It's got the dysregulation profile. So it's been used a lot for, for these kinds of uh, uh, disorders. The strength and difficulties questionnaire is, a, is, a, is a, uh, available online, doesn't cost anything. It's, it's very brief. It's, it's not bad. Um, and then the Connors rating scale has emotional ability. But the point of it is, if I have a kid who's got uh, outbursts and I can see a T-score on any of these things for aggression that's got a T-score of 75, I know that kid's in big trouble. Okay. Um, uh, uh, Lauren Wachschlag, uh, who's in uh, Illinois, has been doing uh, a, a wonderful body of research for, I don't know, 20 years, looking at the components of temper tantrums and uh, her Colleagues have now sort of moved that up to different age groups. And this is kind of a, um, a compilation, which basically breaks down to this. With she's, It's a 22 item thing that she's got, really nice items. They boil down to three aspects that are constant across ages. A mood component, easily frustrated. A behavioral component, which is physical or, um, or really out of control verbally. And a dysregulation part trouble calming down. That seems to occur regardless of age. What changes with age is how frequently it is that gets the person into trouble. So if you're doing a screening in your clinic, you ask about those three things. Oops, excuse me, go back a little bit. This is uh, Argyris Stringaris's uh, Affect Reactivity Scale. Again, a nice brief item, six item measure. Uh, if you get a score of four or more, it's a pretty irritable kid. Trouble with this is it doesn't do outbursts. It just does the mood part. This is something that I developed after years of being on my inpatient unit, getting input from our nurses and from a guy that I've worked with, Mike Potagal, who's a temper tantrum specialist. Make a long story short, the nurses watched kids having outbursts, coded the kinds of problems they had. So I developed what's called the emo eye, and it's a screen. It is not something that is... Um, you know, that stands up next to something like the CBCL. But if the parent fills it out in advance, you can find out about the kid's triggers. You can find out what he does, how often it happens, how long it lasts. And basically anybody that's got four or more behaviors when they have a temper tantrum is in trouble. And um, the emotion dysregulation inventory is another um, a, a cool little seven item that, uh, thing that, was developed by uh, Carla Masevsky for autistic kids, but also normed with um, normal kids. And basically it looks at, did the kid have explosive outbursts, stays angry longer than five minutes, et cetera. And it goes mild, moderate, and severe. I don't know if anybody is using this as an outcome measure, 
but I think it would be a great one to use. It's brief and it really covers the territory. In terms of treatment, and I'm gonna put this up, so don't go running out of the room because I told you these things are for my benefit. There's two things I want you to, to keep in mind with this. First of all, effect size. I think people probably know what an effect size is, but an effect size is kind of a way of determining how much bang you get for your buck. An effect size of one means basically you've moved your rating scale one standard deviation of the measure. And what you have basically with various studies of, of taking care of the aggression or irritability is that you can get an effect size that's fairly decent. So this is the MTA study, an effect size of 0.8 using behavior modification and stimulants. If you use just behavior modification alone, the effect size is 0.4, not so great. A recent meta-analysis looked at effect sizes of, of a bunch of studies, comes up with an effect size of 0.6. But one of the things that's really important to understand about effect sizes is how serious are you at the start? So this is a study that Catherine Gallanter and I did many years ago using the MTA data. And what we found was that if you started out with kids who had uncomplicated ADHD, you could improve their ADHD and, and aggression, um, mood dysregulation symptoms quite considerably. They started out with a score of 1.3 on the SNAP, it ends up 0.9. That's a pretty good effect size. It was a 0.94 effect size. If you looked at kids with a CBCL dysregulation profile, which is very high levels of attention, aggression, and uh, um, anxiety, depression, what you see is they're over the 95th percentile. Okay, they're really sick. They improve considerably. The same slope as the uncomplicated ADHD kids. They improve a lot. A really good effect size, 1.09 but they end up as sick as the uncomplicated ADHD kids started out in their sickness. In other words, they start out sicker. And even when you throw the book at them, they're still significantly impaired. So the effect size is useful. It tells you it was really a, an important effect, but their severity was so bad that at the end, you still had a significant amount of distress. This is Joe Blader's paper that he did multi-site study. And there's a bunch of things that I want you to take out of this because the underlying theme of all of this is managing the ADHD symptoms. So he starts out, he was at Stony Brook when he started this. He starts out, bring me your ADHD aggressive kids. I'll, you know, I wanna randomize them to Valproate and see if we get their mood under control. He brings them in, he throws a book at them in terms of parent training and, and, and optimizing their treatment, their stimulant treatment and so forth. And darn it, if it doesn't have the sample, doesn't say, thanks very much at the end of it, my kid is better, I'm not gonna go into your randomized study. So he does this with an R24, gets funded for a bigger study, ends up with pretty much the same funding. Finding. So here he is, his sample of kids who get you know, optimized stimulant medication, and they really improve. But look at what optimized means. It means, um, it means a lot of parent training, and it means it took about nine weeks on, you know, juggling the long lasting and, and various forms of stimulants to get these kids regulated. Nevertheless, and they ended up, it was about 45 milligrams a day, 15 TID. Nevertheless, their other half of the sample didn't get so much better. They got randomized to risperidone, valproate, or placebo. And as you can see, they improved, but not nearly as much as these guys with a reasonably good effect size, um, better than placebo, eight parent training sessions. They never get as good as this group. So we don't know what's wrong with these kids. We can get them somewhat better, but not better enough. TOSCA study, the take home message from me from the TOSCA study is it wasn't done exactly the same way. The adding risperidone to stimulants still helped the kids. When you take it away, when they don't continue it, the symptoms come back. 
This is not a quick fix. You don't, you know, clean them up nice, dust your hands and say thank you. That's still a problem. People use alpha agonists. Bottom line with the alpha agonists is there isn't a lot of data on clonidine with uh, aggression. Just one study from Phil Hazel uh, from um, um, Australia. There have been several trials of guanfacine, basically secondary analyses looking at kids with aggression and irritability who have been treated for their ADHD. And the bottom line is, if there's a good response to the ADHD with guanfacine, there's a reasonable chance that the irritability oppositional symptoms will improve with a moderate effect size. And there's the graph. It takes a number of weeks, takes four to six weeks before you start seeing a difference from placebo. How about mood stabilizers? Well, basically, if if you look at some of the if you look at some of the bipolar disorder studies and say, you know what? I really think what that is, is that broad phenotype bipolar disorder is dysregulation with ADHD. What you find is by themselves, the mood stabilizers don't do much. Dipalproex response was poor. Lithium response was poor. Um, if the kid had comorbid ADHD, which they did in somewhere between 70 to 90% of the cases, they didn't do very well. They did much better with risperidone than they did with either lithium or valproate. Some of the kids responded, a third of the kids got somewhat better with lithium, a quarter with valproate, but it didn't hold a candle to the atypical antipsychotic. What about antidepressants? Bottom line with the antidepressants is twofold. It took the NIMH 10 years to get a sample of 50 kids into that study. Um, Jim McGuff still hasn't written up his, and I don't know why he hasn't, his comparable study. The bottom line there is, is that um, adding the antidepressants got some improvement, but the sample sizes were too small really to break out who got better and who didn't get better. And they never gave me a severity index. So I don't know how severe their sample was. The bottom line for the algorithm for ADHD and outbursts, at least if you use Steve Plitzka's mania way of looking at things, they meet criteria for mania, no problem. If they, if they get stabilized on optimized stimulant medication, um, good, you know, hallelujah chorus. If the ADHD improves and the outbursts continue, then you add the other aggression mood uh, medications. And if the ADHD gets worse or doesn't respond, then you're left with non-stimulants and antipsychotics and mood stabilizers. My one pearl is, when somebody says, oh, no, I don't want to use stimulants, my kid got worse on stimulants, find out whether the kid got worse while the drug was active or whether it was active after the medication wore off. So whether you had rebound or not versus the medication itself was problematic. If it's rebound, you're dealing with a different problem. The two things you then need is, was the kid better in school during the day? In which case, then you work with the outbursts at the, at, uh, the you know, dysregulation at night. If he wasn't, then you stop the medication. So stimulants are effective. They need to be optimized. Um, and um, unfortunately, we haven't got an answer for the people that don't respond. In terms of the behavioral treatment that we have, we've got a number of different models of, of uh, impulsive aggression that we have been able to come up with. There's the behavioral model that I grew up with, which is the coercive relationship with a parent and the kid. Parent hits the kid upside the head when he has a temper tantrum, the kid calms down, parent learns to abuse kid in order to get the tantrums to end, or the kid waits the parent out. Ah, 20 minutes before she gave in, I guess next tantrum is going to have to last for 25 minutes before she gives in. And so, you know, you reinforce the tantrum. Uh, frustrative non-reward is aggression when the attainment of goal is blocked, aberrant threat processing. Your amygdala says, this is a big threat. I'm going to really respond. The threat isn't that big, but that's not what your amygdala thinks. There's the cognitive inflexibility, poor problem solving, what I call the Einstein uh, um, you know, definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. And the negative com uh, cognitive bias, attending to ambiguous uh, situations and re uh, responding to them as negative. 
establish psychotherapies, our parent training, CBT and anger management, collaborative problem solving or collaborative proactive solutions as Ross Green calls it now, um, uh, dialectical behavior therapy for adolescents. Um, um, John Weiss and Spencer Evans have looked at matching the types of, um, of um, uh, psychological treatment to different conditions so that you do a depression CBT with depression, anxiety CBT with anxiety, parent training with, um, with behavior disorders. And there are new therapies that people are developing. There's a DBT for children, graduated exposure to increasing frustration and the cognitive bias training. Um, Jack and I had the um, pleasure of taking part in a symposium at ACAP where several of these psychotherapy um, uh, programs were described. This is the one that they're doing at NIMH that um, Melissa Brotman is the senior uh, author on, which is basically exposure therapy for irritability, which requires motivational interviewing and psychoeducation and graduating at exposure so the kid is able to tolerate more and more frustration and parent sessions. And it, it sounds like a really nice um, um, intervention. Uh, it requires time. And um, I, used to, I used to wish when I was running my inpatient unit that we could put the kids through a gauntlet before they got discharged where their peers would yell insults at them and they could get through the gauntlet without you know, having a temper tantrum, then they'd be able to be discharged. So same idea. Um, uh, Jim Wax Monsky, a number of years ago, tried to imitate the MTA study. It, um, uh, what's his face? Um, um, was his um, mentor, I bought Bill Pelham, how do I do that? Anyway, Bill Pelham was his mentor. They, they did this study basically where they had a parent training component. They had child groups of making good choices. Um, they had a, a community group. Everybody was stabilized on, on ADHD medication. The short straw had to leave and, and go into the community. They you know, measured a whole bunch of things. Um, the effect size bottom line was about 0.5 to 0.6, which is a, not great. I mean, it's a good effect size, but for all that work, and then the worst part of, of course, is this, they went back two months later and things were back to the way they were before because this is a chronic problem. It doesn't get better that fast. It doesn't stay better. This is uh, data that we generated from our inpatient unit, basically looking at the importance of a behavioral program on a children's inpatient unit where the kids are basically admitted for outbursts. And what it says is, is while we had the behavior modification program, or when we took it away, let me put it that way. When we took it away, seclusions and restraints doubled, okay? They doubled. Whether it was any seclusion, restraint, or hold, or lots of, or more than two seclusion and restraints and hold, they doubled. If you looked at oral PRNs, where they got a shot for their, there were significantly more PRNs, uh, and there were significantly more PRNs for kids who needed a lot of them. Bottom line is things got worse without our behavioral program. In terms of <clears throat> PRNs and IMs and so forth and so on, the data are really, really lousy. There are, th this is what prompted the Carlson Initiative for the Psycho Farm Institute. Um, there has really been no randomized study. Uh, people will use these things in emergency rooms for adults but they have not done it with a control, you know, a placebo control. And so it, this is a dog's breakfast in terms of how useful these medications are. In terms of oral PRNs, we um, valiantly did that study that I told you about where we watched the kids, we timed their, their outburst duration. Um, we looked at uh, different PRNs. Uh, risperidone, diphenhydramine, olanzapine, chlorpromazine, uh, haloperidol, and Ativan. And we didn't do this in a randomized way, by the way. This was basically a whatever the attending <laughs> was wanted. That's what we did. And then post hoc, we looked at the duration of the outburst, hoping that we would get some signal there of one thing being better than the other. And the bottom line was we, we did it, you know, the dose, the risperidine dose equivalent was about one milligram for the PRN. Kids were pretty stable on 
you know, like about two to three milligrams of a, of a risperidone equivalent of an atypical antipsychotic. And here is basically the survival analysis. And what this says, don't, don't pay attention to this yet. What this basically says is that it was a horse race between all of the various uh, oral medications, the, um, <clears throat> the median time to the end of the outburst was about 45 minutes. It didn't matter what drug you got. So that means that about half the sample got their outburst got better in less than 45 minutes. But there were a whole bunch of kids whose outbursts last a really long time. Olanzapine actually did worse than anything, any, anything else, but the sample size wasn't large enough to take that to the bank. But the bottom line is, is there's a wide variety of outburst durations. And at one point we actually did have a placebo control. That was exactly the same amount of time it took the kids to get themselves under control. So it takes a median duration of about 45 minutes for kids who are having outbursts to get themselves under control, whether you gave them an oral PRN or not. The one thing we did find, and this is under review at this point, was that the kids who were actually on a stimulant medication for their ADHD, this was not you gave them a stimulant for their outburst, they were on a stimulant because they had ADHD, their outbursts were actually about 20 minutes shorter than the kids who did not have a stimulant medication. But the stimulant had to be an extended release medication. Don't ask me why. TID short acting didn't do the same thing. It had to be extended release. So a summary of what we need and, and what we know and what we need. Irritability is transdiagnostic. We don't know if its nature changes with diagnosis. Uh, you have to pay attention to the severity of irritability and what's being measured. I, I got interested in that part and, and understand that I have a great deal of respect and affection for Ellen Liebenluft and what she's done at NIMH. But when Melissa would talk about scanning her kids uh, under these various circumstances, I thought, that can't be my kids. They would not sit still long <laughs> enough to get put in a scanner for you know, half an hour. So I don't know who her kids are and they don't ever do a CBCL or something like that that could tell me what their level of severity is. So um, they've, they've mended their ways a little bit. So they, they have some of those data now, but in a lot of the stuff that's gotten published, I don't know how severe it is. And pay attention to the severity of irritability, what's being measured. Is it the mood or the outburst that's being measured? It isn't clear if irritability represents a normally distributed temperamental trait, a severe form of a particular disorder, a separate disorder, the impact of neurodevelopmental issues or overwhelming stress. I don't think it's, I think all of those things are probably likely. Uh, the median duration of outbursts is 30 to 45 minutes, but the duration varies widely. Um, the more in, severe and persistent the symptoms are, the more likely they are to continue. Um, mood and trigger might, uh, the moods and triggers might be targets for psychological treatments um, and the medication and behavior modification for outbursts. Um, and we need to optimize treatment for the primary disorder if you can figure out what that is, but many times it just isn't enough. So this is, these, this is the result of my uh, presidential initiative. Um, we have an emotion dysregulation resource center at ACAP, which you're welcome to tune into. We did a, a couple of, um, of a child and adolescent psychiatric clinics of North America with some very nice chapters in it. Um, we put a parent medication guide out. Um, we did the narrative review that uh, Jack was senior author on, and, and he's a wonderful editor. If you, if you ever want to write a paper, see if you can get him interested, and he's really good. Um, the R code, which I wish we could have done more with, um, and oh, my emo eye, which was published. And what happened to Zeke? Zeke was taken off guanfacine, aripiprazole, and his orosmethylphenidate. He was titrated up on immediate acting methylphenidate to 15 milligrams twice a day, and then converted to beaded methylphenidate long acting 30 milligrams. He worked more efficiently. He was able to delay gratification. And 
um, control is blurting out. Um, he had to be on home instruction. The teachers would not let this child back in class. And so we had to work with the teachers. Uh, the home instruction teacher was able to, to reassure them that really she wasn't getting killed. Um, and so the kid was graduated back into the classroom an hour, two hours, three hours, four hours. They saw he really was much better. And so um, after a month, he was back in school full time. He's done well, well academically and socially. It's actually been two years now. He needed a, a third dose of, of methylphenidate added at 4 p.m. The provider was also instructed on the need to optimize ADHD treatment before adding other medications or assuming there was another cause for the kid's behavior. Not adequately treating him in first and subsequent grades almost ruins this ruined this child's life. I, it took every ounce of control that I had not to really rip this person to shreds. So um, that's it. Um, and I guess we have time for questions. Well, um, I think there are more clinical pearls uh, per, uh, per minute in any talk that you give. Don't forget than... my hearing, speak up. <laughs> Thank you for teaching us so much in, such, in so little time and, um, and such an important timely topic. Um, it's also great to, to see the way you start with a clinical case and a patient and get our interest, and then you tie the research into that. Anyway, just... I really appreciate it. And you're coming out here again. My question, um, thinking about like the, you know, kind of the validity of DMDD and the criteria, um, I'm just, um, I'm struck by how often poor response to treatment, a traditional treatment is a part of that or treatment response. And is it possible to have DMDD that's in a treatment naive individual? And then how that relates to some of the measures, you know, like for example, the case ads, where you ask the questions about DMDD and you come positive um, for, for many, for a much higher rate than it seems like the prevalence. So, well, if, if yeah. I understand you correctly, that, you know, the question is, is how, what will, <clears throat> is, it, it's almost like you're asking me if DMDD is legitimate. Is that, is that sort of what you're asking? No, I'm, I'm wondering if, if it's, if it really is people that are treatment refractory to uh, still have severe problems after treatment. Okay, after okay. Treatment. so, all right, well, that's a good question. So is, is um, but really the question is, is how do we understand people that are treatment refractory? That's really the, the question. That that group, Joe Blader's group over there that, that yeah. just didn't respond when they threw the group out. Well, that, that, and I think that's what we need to look at. We need to look at who those people are. We need to look at whether they're age of, I'm, I'm in the process of finishing a um, future directives paper for Journal of Clinical Child and Adolescent Psychology. And um, you know, what, one of the questions to me is, is how, do you, it, it, how many of these kids have a developmental dysregulation problem? They were irritable babies or they never outgrew the terrible twos. I mean, they had a worse disorder. We know you know, schizophrenia starting, starting in childhood is worse. We know that, I mean, bipolar disorder is rare in children, but when you get it, it's worse. You know, it, 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 most disorders starting in childhood are, 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 are worse. So is this a developmental thing? Um, or is this a, um, is, is this a different disorder? Do we really need a, a, a different disorder? Um, is it, um, it, it, can we break it down? And, and I'm thinking about the age of onset business. If we have an onset, really the kid's onset is after age six or seven, it, it, are we talking about a refractory mood disorder, depression or a refractory anxiety disorder? We haven't broken it down that way. And I think that would be kind of a useful way of breaking it down. That's looking at it diagnostically. Then there's the whole drug business. Why? Why would a legitimate ADHD kid, I mean, some kids respond to medication and some don't. And I don't know why. I mean, I, I just depend on my neuroscientist friends to, to come up with whether they have different receptors or whether they have, you know, they don't tolerate the medication or what the story is. So the question is, is 
how do you understand the drug refractory piece? We were talking at dinner last night. I don't remember whether it got up that far about how some kids can tolerate humongous doses of, of these medications, right? I mean, how the hell does this little kid end up with six milligrams of, of risperidone and, and 10 milligrams? I mean, these, they're horrible. Where's, where's, you, you know, Hilt has, he has all of them and, and the kids aren't dead. You have to wonder why they're not dead. I don't understand that. And so, you know, there, there's a, a lot of different ways that we should be approaching this. And I, I hope we will. I mean, I, I hope this DMDD thing becomes more than an argument of it is DMDD, it isn't DMDD. To, to me, let, let's use it as a way to sort of understand the importance of this area and how we can better understand how to treat it. Okay. Um, hi, Gay. Doug Russell here. Thank you so much for an excellent, very useful talk. Um, my question is about severity and treatment setting. So one of the things that I think a lot of us who rotate in and out of acute care settings are noticing is that the externalizing behaviors that we're seeing are getting worse, or at least we're perceiving them as worse. Um, and, you know, we, we're, you know, as a result, I think, um, many of these behaviors are so bad that they exceed the capacity of our acute care staff to even implement behavioral uh, programs. Um, and at our own institution, it's burning out our staff. Um, it's been dragged into the local news cycle just this week mm -hmm. in Seattle. Um, so my question is, with these pot stirs that are spilling the soup, what do we do? Okay. So it's an interest, and I've given it a fair amount of thought because you're obviously not alone in, in that. Um, I, I started out, um, Mark Stein and I started out together at UCLA. Um, I've worked on inpatient units, you know, either worked on them or as director of child psychiatry, overseen them for most of my life. And um, I don't think this is, forgive my language, the old fart syndrome of, you know, everything was good when I was young and it's terrible now. I, I don't think it's that. What we had in the inpatient unit that I had came out of two things. Bill Pelham's um, MTA, what he did with the behavior modification, and what I learned when, when I was at NIMH on the affective disorders unit about how you work with nurses on inpatient units. It was a structured unit, it was a behavior modification unit. Kids got points for doing things they were supposed to do. They got points taken away if they didn't do that. They got, if they were able to time out, they got to sit in the chair for 10 minutes. If they did something they weren't, you know, it was really bad, they weren't supposed to do it, they timed out. If they couldn't time out in the chair, they went to the seclusion room. <laughs> door open, okay? Just because they were, had to be someplace where nobody could pay attention to them, be kept safe. They, they, weren't, they weren't punished per se. It was basically, you're, you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. We're gonna ignore you. That's where you're gonna be. They couldn't tolerate that. They started to, then you shut the door. And one of the things that the kids learned was temper tantrums didn't get them what they wanted. And so the, um, zeitgeist of the unit was new kid would come on and the other kids would say to him, don't bother to have a temper tantrum, doesn't get you anywhere. We still had kids with temper tantrums and we still had kids that we couldn't manage. About 20% of the kids we threw the book at, we could not manage them, okay? Length of stay was a month to two months. It took a while before you know, kids really got themselves under control and that you could get their parents to have some headway. Another thing we did, let the kids go home on their parents. Okay, we let the kids go home. That was their reward for, you know, they got a certain number of points. They were able to buy a two hour pass, a four hour pass, an eight hour pass. And there was a while we even could do overnight passes. And so the kids were able to practice what they learned. Their parents could practice what they learned. They could get on the bus, go to school, et cetera, et cetera. 
We also had control. When does this end? When you're done. Oh, <laughs> 20 after. Um, well, but you have, you have a staff meeting or something. Yeah, 20, 20 after is the end. Okay. The other thing that, um, that we had was control over the emergency or oh, control over admissions. So we, so known conduct disorder kids were not admitted. Okay, it, it, Bob calls it cherry picking. It is Bob Findling, it is cherry picking. Why waste your resources on somebody that you're not gonna be able to help? So we, you can't always tell who you're gonna be able to help, but sometimes you had somebody on the unit and you know what their colors are, their stripes are, and so you don't readmit them. And, and that's for a couple of reasons. First of all, getting a spot on our unit was important enough so that you wanted to, to use that spot for somebody that you could do something with. And number two, lots of times with the pot stirrers, they really were so effective that you really, they, they wrecked the whole milieu. You, you, you just didn't want them there. So you had some control over your unit. As a result, the staff that I had had been there for like 10 to 15 years. They were a really good staff of nurses, okay? They were a really good staff. Uh, the social worker had been there a long time. We had an in-school program. We still do a, a New York State BOCES program in the school. The teachers were fantastic. The school psychologist who did some of our testing was really outstanding. We had a wonderful staff and a very effective unit. Until the um, adult psychiatry people ended up having so much trouble in the emergency room with seclusions and restraints that the Office of Mental Health came in basically and said, You're, you can't do this seclusion or restraint business anymore. And that affected us as well. We lost the ability then to be able to really set any kind of effective lim limit with the kids. And so then the zeitgeist changed. They can't do anything to you. You can do whatever you want on the inpatient unit. And, and, and that, I'm not kidding you. That's what you overheard the kids say. They knew darn well what they could get away with. And they knew that the staff would get in trouble if they put any kind of restriction on the kid. And so the staff basically started getting assaulted. And they said, you know, it, it was not only that they didn't want to get assaulted, it was heartbreaking for them because they went from a functional unit to not so functional. And the unit went from being a place that people, you know, were willing to sell their grandmothers to get their kids into to a place where nobody wanted to admit the kid. So the census fell. Well, you don't want to have the census fall, right? And then COVID happened. And then, uh, you know, at that point, they needed the beds for other things. And then when they, when the unit recreated itself again, they decided that they would not have acting out little boys that needed seclusion rooms in the, um, in the mix. It would become an adolescent, uh, uh, older child and adolescent unit who, you know, so now we have cutters and, you know, the, the suicidal people and so forth as the, as the patient mix. We still have a problem keeping staff because we still don't have limits that can be set, but I think the, uh, it isn't quite as bad as it was before because we don't have, that. but we don't have control over admissions. Uh, the length of stay is probably 10 to 12 days. Um, and I don't know, I'm gonna go see Jack's unit today. He's gonna tell me how you do DBT in 10 days. And- um, 10 months. Yeah, his is residential. In any event, um, it, it's 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 a it's a it's a story that um, I I figured somebody would ask me about, and so I wrestled with myself about how candid I would be about it. But honestly, I think this is something we have to be candid about because we, we have enough trouble with things that we don't know what how to treat, we, we don't know what to do. 20% of the kids, even on my wonderful unit with a great staff and good attendings and blah, blah, blah. There were 20% of the kids we did not know how to treat. Oh, fine. I mean, there's a lot of diseases we don't know how to treat. We can concentrate. It's really frustrating when you've got people that you do have some idea what to do for them and you can't do it. 
because insurance companies won't let you do it. Insurance companies aren't happy. The kid can go home on a pass. He doesn't have to be in the hospital. Okay, so you, you lost an ability. You, we know what the kids need. We know that you can't just go abracadabra, you're going to get better. We know they have to practice their skills. What the heck is the point of practicing it on the unit? It's at home they're having the problems. But you can't discharge them home to have them come back because then somebody else has the bed. So we know how to manage some of these things, but it's the policies and so forth and so on that are keeping us from doing. It's very frustrating. And um, I guess my thinking on the subject is that uh, I guess I'm known for being pretty forthright. And so I decided I would give you my two cents worth on the subject and take it or leave it. So Chris. Hey, it's Chris Farley. Hey, Chris Farley. I, I, I wanted to I wanted actually to make some actually comments. Make some comments. And just mostly just appreciate, mostly appreciate the, uh, your uh, terrific your talk terrific today. Talk and today and I wish we had meetings, we had meetings uh, like we did uh, at dinner, like last, did night. dinner uh, last night. Uh, the conversation, the conversation was, was uh, provocative. Uh, provocative to at the end of it, at the um, end of it, um, I promised Lucy I promised Berliner that I'd say something pithy. So here we so, go. Here we go. And I was one of those who lived through the, lived lived through the uh, bipolar, bipolar debacle. And I think there I were think a few of you. you. I might have been on the might have been of it, but I especially, of it, but I especially think of you and Alan Lift as really pulling, really pulling child support out of a terrible, out of terrible hole that we got ourselves in. Um, I don't think um, DMD is a perfect solution, perfect solution but, it was, but it was a solution at the time that, that I think has I proved think to have some value, some value, and we still don't know what it is. Know. But you walk but this road in an elegant, elegant artful, artful, thoughtful, thoughtful, thoughtful way, as you always, you always do, do. A, complicated a complicated story, story which basically says basically that says irritability is clearly a clearly dimensional, a issue, dimensional issue, not categorical, not categorical. Um, um, and that there might be things that, that, there might we, can be things that we can do about it. Do we have answers, do we about, have it? answers about it? No, I don't think we no, do. I, don't think we do. I think there's still think a great, still deal, of great deal of work to do. do. But is there a path? Is there a path? And the path, the path you, laid out. you laid out. And I think that's, I think that's, that's just to be reckoned, be reckoned, recognized. recognized. And of just and for the just audience, the audience, despite, despite Dr. Carlson's, Carlson's Kurt Stature, Stature, he really is, he really is in my view, my view, one of the giants of the in the field. And I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I hope I can get my head out the door. <laughs> Thank you. Uh -huh. um, yeah, no, it was wonderful. So and some of this has fallen up on what you were just talking about. It, it, in the task force, we had a lot of discussion about understanding the function of the behavior. And people all talk about that. It's mostly focused on the family's interactions or the school's interactions. Any thoughts about the way our system of care reinforces or doesn't reinforce these behaviors and things we should do differently? You know, one of, one of the other tragedies of our speeded up system, and, and you know, we, we do have a problem of access and we do have a, we, we do, it is important to try to be as efficient as possible with our expensive resources. But there's also a lot of things that you don't learn from experience. And one of them is the reinforcement, how, how reinforcing it is for a kid to have a temper tantrum and bring the system to its knees. That has to stop. And it has to stop early because, and, and I'm, I don't know, maybe actually Carol, ask your husband about this since this is kind of his area of the brain maybe. I think it's like seizures. The more seizures you have, the worse your seizure disorder gets. I think the more outbursts a kid has that can't be controlled, the worse they get. Because one of the things that I noticed with, and again, understand I've been doing this for a lot of years. One of the things that I've noticed has been that, um, as the kids don't do well and get readmitted and get readmitted and get readmitted, they get worse and worse and worse. 
I don't think it's their disorder that gets worse. I think it's their hopelessness that gets worse or the fact that they recognize that what they're doing is actually being more successful. I mean, it's successful in a stupid way because they're now stuck in a hospital somewhere. What kind of a life is that? But at some level, it's, it's enough so that they don't stop doing it. And I really think you have to start that at a, at a pretty young age. And when I say a young age, I mean like, um, like preschool age. I mean, for the kids that have this at, at that end, I think it really has to be. So in terms of our system reinforcing it, I think all of this, you have to have them out in five days, you're not allowed to set a limit, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Now, mind you, I'm not talking about, I, I think another thing that's important is to separate out from restraint, okay? I don't think anybody can put a good blush on restraint about pinning a kid down and tying their hands and putting sheets around them and having four big people stand over them and so forth. I, 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 that's, that's horrible. I, I don't think anybody does it because they want to do it. They do it because the kid is just doing such destructive things, they don't know how to stop it. But I think that's different from putting the kid in a place where he doesn't get the attention. Uh, again, under, forgive my gender, but the kid is in a p place where you can ignore him, he's not getting what it is he wants. And he's saying, you know what? All things being equal, this is not a way I want to spend my afternoon. I think I'll shut up and just, you know, do whatever it is or shut up or take my pill or whatever it is the kid is doing. I think I'll just do it. I mean, I, I watched that happen. I watched that happen. And, and for some of the kids, they felt better when they got control over themselves. They don't like the way they feel when they blow up. They feel proud of themselves when they get some control over themselves. You know, it, it's a it can it's a positive learning thing that we're not allowing the kid to do, and and for those people who say, well, you know, I, I um I, we're not going to do this in this unit. We're gonna uh, we're gonna evacuate the unit. We're gonna evacuate everybody and let the kid run amok and keep everybody safe by by having them go someplace else. Let the kid run amok. That that's okay. I can understand that. How does that work in society? that work in society? I'm going to go to the bus station and, and, I'm, and I'm not going to get the ticket I want and I'm going to suddenly blow up, right? And all of a sudden, Penn Station's going to evacuate. Oh, Jay didn't get a ticket. Good. He got a ticket. That's not going to happen. So I don't think that we're training the kids by doing that to do what it is that they need to, to do in polite society. So it may be helpful in terms of getting the kid off the unit without you know doing something restrictive but i don't know how that's going to help the kid in the long run and i don't hear people discussing that i don't hear the difference between um a, a management or de-escalation that's another one de-escalation is great i don't think we should be saying ha ah, you are a fat slob of course you know the, you know, put your you know i'm not going to give you what you want because you're a fat slob i mean you're not going to insult the kid and and Make them, I can say that because you're not. But, um, but, but the point is, you know, de escalation is a no brainer. Of course, you're going to try to do something to not make the kid worse. But there's a difference between calming down that um, uh, explosion and keeping future explosions from taking place. And so the, you're, you're talking about a different intervention for a different problem. I don't hear any discussion about those kinds of things. And so the question is, how do we move this whole thing forward? Well, that's what people are trying to do with their irritability initiatives and all of these future directions and so forth and so on. I think, I think people recognize that we're not even close to where we need to be. I just don't know that we've got the mechanisms to get us there. I don't know that, I don't know who's funding meetings to be able to talk about it. I don't know whether regulators are, are willing to listen to some of this kind of stuff. I don't know, and it's really what we need to do in the well, thank you, Gay. I think I feel like we, we do have to wrap up. Uh, there's so much wisdom here. Um, ACAP, I'll just put a plug in. ACAP's going to be here in Seattle next year. Maybe this is a good topic for a symposium or a clinical conference or, you know, um, to continue this conversation. 
Um, I also wanted to mention that the paper that came that Jack's a senior author and your first author on is a JCAP paper that came out in 2023. There's also a JAMA PEDS paper, right, with a somewhat different focus. And then the paper with Lucy. Do you want to just mention those three? Um, well, I guess I had a couple of them up there. The, the paper that, uh, oh, well, Jack, why don't you tell them about this? Because your treatment papers are really lovely paper. I, I, I gave you some of the summary of it. But... Okay. Well, so just to, the, plug them. just to plug them. So the main goal of the task force was review, do a big narrative review of, of outbursts, both diagnostic issues and treatment issues, and kind of hopefully moving forward. It's a, it's, so it's a much longer, more detailed kind of academic things, which means no one will read it. Uh, so, but it, that's uh, in the Orange Journal. Uh, and it is, it's a nice paper. Uh, and then, and Lucy Berliner bugged me because Jack, it's way too long. No one's ever going to read the damn thing. You should write something short and brief that people would actually use policymakers, pediatricians, that kind of stuff. And so that's what we did. That's so there's like a pithy 1200 word article that Gay I and Lucy wrote uh, for JAMA Peds. And it's it's the Reader's Digest version. Yeah, we, have, we, we can't we can't cite what the volume is, et cetera, offhand. I, I, but I, I had to put this up because I couldn't even remember the the uh, the big narrative review was in the February JCAP. Uh, your Jam of Peach paper. I don't know if you would remember. Oh, if I get within a decade, I'm pretty good. It came out this past year, so oh, no, it yeah. Came out this past year. I don't know what month. Yeah, I don't. But. We love you, Gay. Thank um, you. 